Hello, my name is Michael Engel, and I'm a curator of entomology here at the University of Kansas Natural History Museum. And today I want to talk to you about insects. Our world abounds with life. There are more than two million described species, and we discover new ones every day. And yet, more than 50% of all of this diversity has six legs. The planet truly belongs to the insects. And something that we tend not to think about is that this life has a history, an extensive history that goes back millions and millions of years. And while we think of fossils and paleontology in terms of dinosaurs or fossil birds or fossil hominids, we tend to forget about the fossil insects. And yet insects are part of that history, and they're a big part of that history since they are the most dominant form of life on our planet. And so today, let's take a look at a little bit of the fossil history of insects. So why don't we go inside and look at some fossils? Insects can be preserved in many different ways. Um, much like vertebrate fossils that you may think of, um, many insects are preserved as impressions or compressions in stone, um, such as this large relative of a dragonfly called a griffinfly. And this one's extinct, it comes from Kansas, and is about 285 million years old. And you can see the veins of the wings are nicely etched into the stone, and so the wings preserve particularly well in this form of matrix. Um, the bodies tend to get be a bit more compressed, but you can still get a lot of information and detail out of such compression fossils. This is another 285 million year old Kansas insect. This one is um, a Paleodictyopteran, a group that does not survive to this day. Um, and so we don't, unfortunately don't have a common name for it. Aside from compressions, perhaps more famously, insect fossils are known as being preserved in amber. Amber, of course, is an, a resin that is exuded by trees. Um, as an immune response or a reaction to stress. And so it is sort of a way in which the plant is attempting to heal itself and it exudes this substance, which then can trap organisms inside and then it falls to the ground and becomes um, preserved and uh, ultimately hardens into the amber fossil that we know today. When amber first comes out of the ground, it doesn't quite look as you might expect. And so this, for example, is a rather large piece of Indian amber, and it doesn't look like much other than sort of a lightweight rock, or even may even resemble a piece of coal to some degree. But amber is really quite remarkable. One thing you can tell right away about amber is that it fluoresces. So if you shine UV light on it, it will have a nice fluorescence pattern that appears. Once it is cleaned up, sort of polished and prepared, however, a, a piece like this will come out looking like this. And this is what we're all so very familiar with and that people make jewelry out of. And inside you can see there is a tiny insect preserved within. And this one is about 45 million years old and uh, comes from the Baltic region. We're most familiar with amber, like Baltic amber or Dominican amber because they pop up in jewelry shops and we hear about them a lot. But amber actually comes from a whole variety of places all over the world. Places as exotic as New Jersey and India, um, from Burma to the Baltic coasts, all the way up from the northern coasts of Alaska down to the tropical forests in Peru. Amber is around us everywhere. Um, and ranges in age anywhere from about 15 or 14 million years old all the way up to some of the oldest ambers, which are at about 135 million years old. Insects have been with us for a very, very long time. The earliest evidence that we have of insects goes back over 400 million years, placing them among some of the earliest of terrestrial organisms. And over the last 400 million years, they've really come to dominate life on this earth, and they've experienced some of the greatest cataclysms that life has ever gone through. Um, so at the end of the Paleozoic, for example, when 94% of all life went extinct on earth, the insects were already there. They had diversified, they had flourished, they had taken over the world, and then they were largely decimated. And then they had to rebound and take over the world again. So if you think of it, insects have done the incredible twice. They dominated the earth once, they got wiped out, and they had to come back and dominate the earth again. But yet, then we go to uh, what they call one of the lesser 
mass extinction events at the Eocene-Oligocene transition about 35 million years ago, when we went from a globally warm hothouse planet down to a much cooler temperate planet. And we went through this major climatic event with this huge climatic shift and this huge cooling and this huge drying that came about at this time period. And we see that a lot of insects that were sitting in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere really either contracted or dramatically altered their ranges or were utterly wiped out because of climate change. And so it really makes us um, think hard about how our insects upon whom we literally are dependent in order to survive will fare as we go into the future and as our climate begins to shift. So we know that climate is impacting insects in a dramatic way, but how do we really get an idea that this has happened in the past? Well, it's from insect fossils, much like these that we have with us, um, or preserved in stone. Um, either amber or stone, this record helps us document the once occurrence of organisms outside of ranges that we understand today. One group in particular that we love to hate are the termites. And there is a very large, robust termite in Australia called Mastotermes darwiniensis. And it is the sole survivor of an entire family, a very early and primitive family of termites called the Mastotermidity. And again, today it only occurs in Northern Australia. But when we look into the fossil record, we can see that master termitids occurred virtually throughout the world. They were in South America, they were in the Dominican Republic, they were in Mexico, they were throughout Europe. Even this, this subtropical termite was, could be found you know, along the Baltic coasts. And so what we can see just in this one example of many examples like this is how a once widely distributed organism through time had its distribution contract and contract and contract with extinctions, localized extinctions, leaving just a relic today found in Australia. And what we've been able to determine by looking at its occurrence in the past is that when its distribution is contracted, it has been the result of major climatic shifts, making it no longer possible for it to survive in a particular area. So if you'd like to find out more about insects and insect fossils, you can reach out to us at the University of Kansas Natural History Museum. Thank you.